Hi everybody, welcome back to our lecture on multi-rate signal processing, this time more on window functions. But first take a look at our Jupyter Notebook tutorials at our GitHub page here. So we have a series of tutorials uh, for each lecture and um, you can um, see them when you scroll down here for this case uh, to number 6a and there you can click on Google Colab or bind or NB viewer and then the notebook starts in an interactive mode in your browser so here in your browser including short videos um, for each section so this includes the code examples um, of our lecture and blocks um, which can be executed within the browser so that's um, a specialty of, of um, Google Colab and such, uh, and Jupyter Notebook, um, that this allows you to actually change the code in the browser and execute it anew so that you can see what changes. So you can click on a block and play, and a play button will appear. When you click on it, it executes that block. And as I just mentioned, you can also modify it. So we want to take a look at it. So this is how our Colab um, or the Jupyter Notebook looks like. So in the beginning you just have a list of the files which are in there and then you can see the readme which actually contains um, um, the, the links that you can click on. So here you can see it. Um, it starts uh, with number one, introduction. So you can also try all the lectures that we already had here on Google Colab, for instance, you can also use Binder and NB Viewer. Um, YouTube just contains the videos. And here you can uh, try which works best on your computer. So for me, Google Colab works fine. It executes everything. So I'm happy with that. So in the meantime, we are down at number 6A. So here you go to Google Colab and then you click on it and then it loads um, the Jupyter Notebook file. So here you can see this link. So it um, starts this Jupyter Notebook file. So Jupyter Notebook is um, this um, um, system which um, can display Python code on your web browser and um, also already executed in your browser. And you can even modify it. And you can also use it to include videos, as you can see here. So this video is the first explanation, and this is included using um, this code. So in this case, this is HTML code, um, and not Python code, but it still works. So actually, this is the first code block, and you can actually execute this code block, then it just runs it. It gives you a warning, say run anyway, and then you can see it loads this video. So maybe sometimes if the video is not loaded, you can just click on the run button here and then it reloads this video. And uh, then it also runs here in the page. So you can see it. Hello there, it and welcome running. to this collection of notebooks and tutorials. So it's really convenient. So basically it gives you additional explanations uh, on top of what you already can read here and you can see more examples. So this is actually what we come to next to on the slides. So let's go back to the slides. So how do we design window functions to obtain our stop attenuations? Right. So there are two versions for windows for, of even and odd length. Uh, so the number of samples or tabs is even or odd. And we now analyze a few common window types. So we already saw the rectangular window, right? This is the basically the most straightforward one, and this is the one that we obtain from minimizing the mean squared error. So this is constant one over the length of the window. So here the length of the window goes from zero to L minus one, where L is the window length. So we can do it in IPython and take for example l length equals 16 
So then we just make this window. H is ones, 16 ones. And then we import scipy signal as signal because then in the next line we need frac z from signal to obtain the frequency response of this window function h. Right? This gives us uh, the frequency scale omega and the corresponding frequency response um, h of this window function. And then we simply plot it. Here we can see x-axis has our um, normalized frequency and then we take the magnitude of our frequency response plus this uh, small epsilon to avoid log of zero. So here we take 20 times log 10, the dB number for voltages or currents. We, not, we scale the axis to the interesting regions and then we give it labels. And here you can see the result. Right. So here you can see the passband here is in the, in the region of 25 dB. And then here the first side lobe is at 10 dB, which means we have an attenuation relative to the passband here of about 15 dB, which is not really much. And you can actually also see it here in the Jupyter notebook. So here we have the same code. So first we do the imports, matplotlib, scipy signal as signal, and then we have the code here. And when I click on this field, click on the run button, run cell, then we actually get this um, frequency response. So actually the same thing that we just saw. But now we can also easily change it here. So let's see what happens if we change it to 32. Right, so now I double the window length, run it again, and now you can see here the passband becomes much more narrow, right? Only about half as wide, but you can see here we still have only about 15 dB attenuation to the first side lobe. That didn't change. We can even go to 64, run it again, right? And here we have a here we have an overrun from our scale, so we can actually change it here. Let's see, scale up to 40. Yeah, see, that easily works. So now we have 37 to 22, so again, it's about 15 dB. That doesn't change. So, quite nice for experimentation. We can also go the opposite way, only have 8 run it again, and this is what we get. Right again, we should have about 15 dB here. Right, but now the main lobe is much wider. Okay. You know, so this is actually called cells. Click on a cell block. Okay, so you can also see from this picture here that we have a main lobe which has a width, a 3 dB width of about 0.05 pi, which is 0.16. So 3 dB width means the width uh, up to it, which it is down by 3 dB. So for that it also helps to have this actually plotted on um, on a plot um, window so that we can see the values more closely. Or we could also try it on, on Jupyter Notebook by scaling. So here we have 16. So I'm going back to 30. And now let's try this with 20. Yeah, so here you can see now the 3 dB width. So we have 24, right? And then we want to go to 21, which is here. And this is roughly, I would guess, 0.2, right? So around 0.2 here. If you want to have it more exactly, we um, again need to rescale this axis too. So let's go to 0. 
two. Yeah, so now it's zoom up or zoom in. So now I have 24 to 21. So this is roughly 0.175. Right. Yeah. So roughly correct. So the side lobe attenuation, which we already saw, is about minus 15 to maybe minus 25 if you go to the further side lobes. But we can design different windows which de-emphasize a transition region from pass band to stop band and emphasize the stop band attenuation more than the pass band attenuation. Right? This is what we didn't do for the rectangular window. For instance, if we say we don't care so much about the ripples in the pass band, but we want to really have a high attenuation in the stop band. And this can be seen as minimizing a weighted squared error function, where the parts that we want to emphasize get a higher weight. In Python, we can formulate an error function with a weighted squared error as follows in the following function, where we have PB for the pass band and TB for the transition band. This is the number of frequency samples in those bands, pass band and transition band. Um, and this is the corresponding error function. Right? So you can see how I define it. This is my error function. In goes my window function h. And here I define the number of frequency samples which I want to use for the optimization. Here is my desired pass band. So pb is the number of frequency samples divided by 4. So the pass band should be 1 quarter of my total frequency range from 0 to pi or from 0 to Nyquist. The transition band should be 1 eighth of that, right? 1 eighth, 1 eighth of the number of frequency samples in my total frequency range. Yeah, and then I compute the frequency response of the specified window for the error function, right? Here we get w and the h and then here I have my desired frequency response. So desired is once in the pass band. So the pass band should have a factor of one. So remember, this is now not the dB scale, but the linear scale, where we have a factor of one in the pass band. Then we have zeros for the rest, right? So outside from, of the pass band, we want, would like to have attenuation. But now we also specify the weights of, from, uh, with which we want to um, um, calculate our error function. So the weights now are ones for the pass band. So they get a weight of one. Then we have weights of zero for the transition band, which means uh, the error in the transition band is not counting. We multiply each error value in the transition band with zero, so it doesn't count for the error function. But then for the stop band, here now follows the weights for the stop band. So here this is the number of frequency samples without the pass band and without the transition band, and we multiply the ones there with a factor of thousand. So we have a factor of thousand for each error in the transition band, uh, I mean in the, in the stop band. So each, each stop band error is weighted with a factor of 1000 for the total error. Right? That means an error in the stop band counts 1000 times as much as an error in the pass band. So that reflects our desire to have a smaller error in the stop band. So in the end, if um, all will be equal um, through the optimization, then we will have errors in the stop band, which only are one thousandths as big as the errors in the pass band. Right. So this is then the, the final error is then the magnitude of the difference between the obtained and the desired frequency response in the linear scale here magnitude to, opt, um, to avoid negative values multiplied by the weights that we just constructed. 
and then just sum everything up. Right? This is your um, sum of uh, the weighted absolute errors. And this is what it returns. So also observe that in this case, I use the absolute error and not the squared error. Right? You can do that. So it, it, sometimes it makes a difference if you take the squared or the absolute error in, in this case, but usually it doesn't really make such a big difference. Yeah, so then we can apply optimization to obtain the window or filter samples, which minimize this error, for instance, using SciPy Optimize. So we are lucky that Python has very powerful optimization routines in SciPy, and Optimize um, is one of the libraries that, you, that has those optimization functions. So that saves us a lot of work. Right, and a good optimization is really, uh, really valuable. Valuable. And in this example, a window of filter H, uh, depending on how it is used, of links sixteen samples or tabs is obtained. So here again, we use length sixteen, and the output is a either a filter of this bandwidth, a low pass filter where we have uh, the passband as one quarter of the total frequency range from zero to Nyquist. Or we could also use it as a window function, for instance, if we have a band pass filter. So this gives us a low pass filter using the window method. Um, could also give us passband filters as desired frequencies or high pass, as we will see a little later. Right, so here you can see how you apply the optimization. You apply, you import Cyper Optimize as opt, and here you apply it opt minimize. So this library has a function, the optimization function minimize. It takes our error function as argument. So this is the name of our function which minimize will call. And then the next argument is the starting point. In this case, 16 random numbers. Rand gives us numbers between 0 and 1. It doesn't really matter so much here. The most important information for minimize is that um, this gives the format for the input of the error function. So this tells minimize that it wants to have an array of 16 samples as input. That's the most important information from this argument here. Yeah, and then it runs. It might take a while, depending on how complicated this error function is. In our case, it will be really fast. And then min out is an object which contains several informations. Uh, in our case, we are just in, uh, interested in the, in the x um, object, in the x entry. So x is um, the argument which gives the minimum. So minout.x gives us um, the coefficients h which minimize the error function. So then we can also let it run in a terminal shell. Let's see if that also works here in Jupyter Notebook. So here you can see actually, maybe I make it a little bigger here. So here is our code. So first we define the error function. So we run this code here so that it imports NumPy and SciPy signal as signal and then defines this error function. And here, um, let's see, this is the error function. Here we can view the desired um, weights. So let's run this too. So this is also a nice plot because it visualizes what we just did here. Here is the desired passband. So that's num uh, frac samples divided by four. So one quarter of the total frequency range of 512 samples. And the uh, transition band is one eighth of it, right? And then we can see it. So here, 
First, it plots the passband. This is the desired passband, right, which you can see here. Right, so in the passband, we have all ones, and then the rest, the desired would be zero. But then we also need to weigh our error, and the resulting weights can be seen here. So we see here the transition band is between, so here between those two, this is the transition band, and that's where the weight will be zero, right? In the pass band, the weight is one, which you cannot really see here, because it's just one. And here in the stop band, you have a factor of 1000. So actually you can see, um, yeah, let's see. Unfortunately, we cannot zoom in here, so we have we we would have to use um, the um, axis um, function to scale to see that this is one. But we can actually see also here in this plot that the beginning is ones for the pass band, followed by zeros for the transition band, and then we get thousands for the rest. So this is what we can see here, right? So then we can apply the optimization. So you can also see this video as explanation. And here you can now see the optimization coming. So here, Cyper optimize as opt, some random input, and then as a result, the output. Let it run, and it's done already, even though it runs in the browser here. So here's the result. Yeah, so you can see this is the result, and you can see actually it's not perfect. So here this this top is not perfectly symmetric. So that also shows you that the output of a optimization uh, does not need to be perfect. It's uh, obtained by numerical optimization, and that stops when it's um, um, good enough. So there's uh, some stopping criteria. Uh, which tells us uh, or which tells the optimization that it doesn't change anymore or that or it doesn't change much and then it stops so here it's not perfect but it's good enough so you know and you see it's a negative sign but it doesn't matter so here this goes down it doesn't matter because we optimized only for the magnitude and the magnitude is the same right you could also now make a little experiment and say we start with minus starting point. So now I give it a negative starting point. Let's see what happens. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting, looks the same. Yeah, now it even looks a little bit uh, more odd. Interesting. So I'm going back to plus again. Each time I run it, I have different random starting points. So let run let this run too. Oh, now it looks good. So it's almost perfect here. Yeah, so that's also the influence of the random starting point. So the random starting point indeed gives you different results. Maybe slightly different results, but sometimes it can also get stuck into in local minima and then it's worthwhile to restart it with another random starting point. Right, so also here you can see it's slightly not symmetric. Yeah, this is the resulting frequency response of our obtained window, and you can see it's actually quite nice. And indeed, it has a much higher attenuation now, right? Here we have an attenuation from, say, minus 5 to minus 80, so maybe 70, minus 75 dB attenuation. So maybe we have that here too, right. So here you can see the resulting frequency response. Let me run it for our obtained version. Yeah, so see, it looks pretty much the same, but not exactly the same. It's slightly different when you compare it here. The side lobes look slightly different. And that's because each time you have a different random starting point, you get a slightly different result, but overall it has the same behavior.
right? It all, always has this minus 80 dB down here. So it's pretty good. So that shows us that we were successful uh, improving the stop at attenuation a lot from say minus 15 to minus 20 now to minus 80 dB. So it's a big success actually. Yeah, so usually this optimization gives the best answer for most applications, but there are also more prefabricated windows for filter design with different trade-offs of transition bandwidth and stop band attenuation for convenience. Right. So here's the first, the so-called race cosine window, also known as Han or Henning window. So it's really simple. It's basically a um, negative cosine function, which is shifted um, so that it's all positive, right? So you have a complete cosine wave. And remember, cosine starts at 1 and ends at 1. If we have a negative cosine and multiplied with 0.5, it starts at minus 0.5 and ends at minus 0.5. And if we then add, add a plus 0.5, then we start and end with zero, uh, with zero, and we have a slow rise and slow decay in the end. So, yeah. So this is actually for even window length. And here's an example for the even window length of 16. So here we can plot it then with um, L equals 16, and this is what we get. So here, we have a slow start and a rise, and here it's slow and slowly ends, and it's above zero. Yeah, then we can um, check it out in the frequency domain using Frexy. For that, we define a function Frexy plot, which automatically plots the result for convenience. So we already defined it, so we import it here and then we plot it. So here you can see the resulting plot with magnitude and phase. So here you can see we have passband 20 dB, first side lobe uh, a little bit more than minus 10, uh, minus 10 dB, so we have a little bit more than 30 dB, and here you can see it's linear phase because it's symmetric. Right. So here we can see that uh, we also obtain a much higher attenuation than for the rectangular function uh, because the first side lobe is at over minus 30 dB attenuation measured from the maximum of the main band lobe, the pass band. And it even continues further off in the stop band and we get about minus 60 dB attenuation in the end. So here, down here we get to 20 minus 40 is minus 60. 20, mi 20 minus minus 40 is 60. Yeah, but this is at the cost of a wider main lobe. So it's 3 dB width is about 0.1 pi. And this is about twice as wide as for the rectangular window. So this leads to a wider transition band. And this shows the general trade-off. We can trade transition width for stop at attenuation, right? The wider we make the transition band, the more stop at attenuation we will get. And this is also what we would observe using the optimization that we just saw. When we make the transition band wider, we get more um, stop at attenuation, but of course then at the cost of the wider, uh, wider uh, transition band. This is the version for odd window length. Here we just have an L plus one, right? Compared to the previous one, here we had an L, and here we have an N plus 0 0.5, and instead here we have an N plus one, right? So it's basically shifted by half a sample. So here's the example for L equals 17. So here the Python formula for um, L equals 17. Here you can see the plot. And now you can see that because of this shift by half a sample, we get now 
exactly one sample in the center. Right? There's one sample exactly in the middle here. Before, for the even um, number of samples, we had two samples right next to the center, symmetric around the center. Now we have one sample right on the center. Yeah, and the next version is the sign window. So this is another window function. It simply consists of half a sine wave, right? So instead of um, two pi, we have pi and n goes from zero to n minus one. So this is half a sine wave. So this is for even length. You have the 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 here. And for odd lengths, we have the plus one here and this L plus one. Here's the example for even L equals 16. <coughs> so here's the plot. <coughs> so here we can see it starts more steep from zero compared to the raised cosine. The raised cosine was slowly rising. This is quickly rising, right? So then we can take a look at the frequency response. So here we can see it. Again, starts at 20 dB in the pass band, and then it goes down only slightly below zero. So this has less attenuation. The first side lobe has just a little bit more than 20 dB attenuation here. But also the main lobe is more, now more narrow. Yeah, so we can see that the main lobe is somewhat narrower then for the raised cosine window with a 3 dB width of about 0.04 pi. But the first side lobe has only about minus 20 dB attenuation. But the further side lobes increase in attenuation. So you can also see it falls off more and more. Yeah, this attenuation is more than for the rectangular window, but less than for the raised cosine window. On the other hand, its transition bandwidth is less than for the raised cosine window. So again, this is this um, trade-off between transition band and stop at attenuation. Yeah, observe that this um, always results in positive values for the window functions and that they are perfectly symmetric. For odd lengths, there's a sample right at the center. For even length windows, uh, the center is right between two samples. Yeah, so another interesting window is the so-called Kaiser window. Right? The Kaiser window now has a uh, parameter um, beta. And this parameter beta can now be used for this trade-off between transition bandwidth and stop attenuation, attenuation. So this is a way of just trying out different windows uh, without using optimization because here we have this beta. So this is the definition of the Kaiser window. And um, this I0 is, a, <coughs> is the so-called Bessel function. So here we can see the definition of the Bessel function, I0 of x, uh, one plus this infinite sum here, where in practical designs often just the first 20 terms are used. And you can also read more about it in the book by Strang and Nguyen, Wavelets and Filter Banks. So we use this I0, I0. This is the argument of this function. And then we divide it by this function just of our parameter beta for normalization and multiply it by 0.5. And the magnitude of n is between, um, is less or equal L over two, which means it runs from minus L over two up to plus L over two. So that's slightly different than our preview, previous windows uh, where the N was always positive. So here when you compare, here the N was going from zero to L minus one. And here the N goes from minus L over two to plus L over two. But it doesn't really matter, you just need to keep it in mind. Yeah, so here's an example, again for L equals 16, and now with beta equals two. 
in Python. So uh, when you open it in IPython, um, then you will find this function Kaiser right there. So Kaiser, Kaiser is a function in, um, uh, in SciPy signal, I guess. And then we can plot it, and this is what we get. So here we already have a have it shifted such that we have the positive um, um, values for the index. So let me compare that here with uh, Jupyter notebooks. So you can see again the window functions. So here the raised cosine, here the sine window. And keep in mind, you can play around with um, changing the window length. So let's see, for instance, here you can say 32. Yeah, and then you can see it's not working because you also need to change this to 32. Yeah, so now it's better. And then you can also see the changed Oh, interesting. Fraxy is not defined. Why not? We forgot to import it somewhere. Interesting. Here, dev Fraxy. So here it's defined. So hopefully now it's there. Uh, so you have to be careful to execute those code blocks in the right order because it remembers what you did. So here it defines the Fraxy, right? So before you, before you let this cell run, it doesn't know Fraxy. So now I let it run. Let's see, here it should work. Yes, so there it works. So now let's try the cell that I just changed. So this one here. Yes, so now it works, right? So remember to um, do the cells in consecutive order. Sometimes if you omit a cell, running a cell, then it's not present in the next one. Yeah, and, and here you can see the same effect, right? We made the window longer, which means the main lobe becomes smaller, but the height of the ripples stays the same. They are just more compressed, right? So, same effect. This is basically the Gibbs phenomenon, which I mentioned last time, that the ripples, the height of the ripples doesn't change. Yeah, so now to the Kaiser window. So this is what we just saw. And, oh yeah, you can see it's in NumPy. So the function Kaiser is in NP, uh, so NP is NumPy. That's where it's located. Yeah, so sometimes IPython can be confusing because you don't know from which library uh, the function came from. So now this is the version for beta equals 2. So this looks pretty much like a sign window, very similar. Now you can check out a frequency response. And indeed, you only get about 20 dB stop attenuation to the first side lobe. So it's not, not really great. Right, so that's why we can also try beta equals 8. So here we have now beta equals 8. So this looks like, like a more extreme co raised cosine window. So it's really starting slowly here in the ends. Um, so soft start and soft ending. And when we look at the frequency response, we can see that now it gets much better attenuation. So here we start at about 20, goes down to minus 40, so we have about 60 dB between pass band and the first lobe. So here we have minus 60 dB attenuation. So this would already fulfill our requirements. So going back to the slides, so here we can see it again, 20 down to minus 40. So it's pretty good. So I mentioned last time that we would like to have minus 60 dB in the stop band. 
So this is doing it, right? So quite nice. Yeah, and this is another window. This is the so-called uh, Vorbis window. Um, it has this closed form expression, um, similar to the Bessel function, but it doesn't have any um, uh, parameter to tune. So this is fixed. And when we take a look at it using Python, this is what we get. So this looks like a mix between a signed window and a rectangular window. Right? It has this round edges here, but it's um, flat here in the middle. So when you look at the frequency response, we can see it's indeed kind of narrow here in the pass band. But then also the first side lobe is um, only about uh, 20 dB attenuated. So also like the sine window. But then the further side lobes decay faster than for the side for the sine window. Right? So this is the advantage of this Vorbis window. Yeah, so minus 20 dB stop attenuation, but you have more attenuation in the further side lobes, more than the sine window. Yeah, so it's it results in a good stop attenuation, but it's lacking the additional parameter we saw in the Kaiser window. And the MPEG AAC audio coder also uses an optimized window function, the so-called Kaiser Bessel derived KBD window, which results from numerical optimization. So this is just like we did before in the beginning. So in conclusion, filter design with a window method. So we start with the ideal filter, for instance, the sync function for low pass filter, which is usually infinitely long. To make it causal and to obtain a desired trade-off between the um, transition band with and the stop band attenuation, we multiply it with a finite length window. Right. So we have to choose what kind of window we would like to have, and this type of window gives us this uh, trade-off. This window is e either obtained by optimization or is chosen from one of the prefabricated one. So longer filters also lead to narrower transition bands. So if we find that uh, none of the compromises, the trade-offs fit our desired filter, then uh, we need longer filters because that allows us to have narrow transition bands. The resulting frequency response after multiplying the ideal impulse response, for instance the sync, with the window function is then the convolution of the ideal frequency response and the window frequency response. Right. So result in the resulting pass bandwidth is the ideal pass bandwidth plus the pan ba pass bandwidth of the window. So basically it adds up right, because of the convolution. The resulting stop band starts at the stop band frequency of the ideal frequency response, the cutoff frequency, plus the frequency of the start of the stop band of the window function. So again, it's adding the transition band. Right. So to obtain a given pass band or stop band, this has to be taken into account. And the cutoff frequency of the ideal filter has to be modified accordingly. So here I should add uh, the ideal filter. So for instance, we saw that the Kaiser window at least fulfills the requirement for the attenuation of our down sampler application example, where we want to have the minus 60 dB stop at attenuation. So how do we get the correct start of the stop band for attenuating the aliasing for down sampling sufficiently using our filter design method? Right. So our stop band should start at 0.5 times um, Nyquist for a downsampling factor of n equals 2. So here one is the Nyquist frequency. Looking at the, at the Kaiser window with beta equals 8, we see that we do get minus 60 dB at a normalized frequency of about 0 0.36. 
Hence, our ideal filter needs to have the end of its pass band at 0 0.5 minus this 0 0.36 equals to 0 0.14. So we make our pass band now more narrow in order to accommodate the transition band such that the stop, stop band already starts at 0 0.5 because we know at half Nyquist we already uh, may get alias artifacts which we need to supp suppress by at least these 60 dB. So that's why we need to make the pass band more narrow instead of the stop band um, because we really want to have the, uh, the stop band start at that frequency. So that makes our pass band more narrow. And here's now for, uh, the stop band and the cutoff frequency for our ideal filter, which is now 0 0.14 pi, if we now normalize pi as the Nyquist frequency. So here we need the multiplication with pi, since for our formula, pi is the Nyquist frequency. So yeah, this is um, always something you need to keep in mind, this, um, these differences in normalization. So often in, um, in filter design methods, um, one is Nyquist, or sometimes one is uh, the sampling frequency. So now we just need to plug this into our formula for the ideal filter, the sync function for the low pass with filter length L equals 16. So this is our usual formula. Here we have our omega C and we now made our omega C, the cutoff frequency, uh, smaller down to 0 0.14 pi. So we just need to plug it into this formula here. Yeah, so we can also, instead of having this omega C, we can uh, put a pi here in this formula because then uh, in Frexy we get a pass band at 0 dB, which is uh, sometimes more convenient. But it doesn't really matter that much. So now we have our sync function and we can multiply it with our Kaiser window. So you can see that here. Again, in IPython, we now make our n in the range from 0 to including 15. Then we define our sync function over this interval here. You might remember we just need to compute the sync function over this interval because that's the length we get after applying our window. The window has this length of 16 samples and the 8 again was the Kaiser parameter. So then we element-wise multiply those two, our sync function and the Kaiser window, and then we can plot it. So this is what we will get. And we can also see it in our um, Jupyter notebooks. So for that we need to go to part 6b. Uh, we need to go back a lot. Leave side. So here, leave side, Google Colab. So now it loads the new IPython uh, Jupyter notebook. So here we are with the videos. So here you can see again the formulas that we just saw. And here is now the code. So here we define our um, ideal impulse response, the sync, and multiply it with a Kaiser window and plot it. So run anyway. Let's see what it does. For some reason it takes a moment. But here you go. So this is now our obtained filter impulse response, our low pass filter, the ideal low pass filter multiplied with our um, Kaiser window. Now we can check out the frequency response 
So again, we need to define our Frexy, including the plotting for multiple use. So now I just did it. And now we can execute this function Frexy. And indeed, this is what you get, right? So here we see indeed, so we start at around zero dB here in the passband and we get at frequency half Nyquist, which is 1.5 something. Indeed, we get our start of um, our um, stop end. And we see we have indeed more than minus 60 dB attenuation. So here we have uh, almost 80 dB attenuation. So that's surely enough. But then when we look at our pass band, the pass band is, um, there's also a lot of attenuation going on here on the, on, the, uh, on this end. So actually the transition bands already starts in, in this area and all this is transition band. So we have a fairly wide transition band now. So that's, that's not so good, right? So this is what we just saw here a wide transition band, but a sufficiently high stop band attenuation. Yeah, so that's good enough, but the pass band up to about now minus 60 dB, 60 dB. so now we are happy for the pass band to go up to 60 dB attenuation. Uh, it's only up to a normalized frequency 0 0.15, which is usually not enough. But we didn't really specify it, but for practical purposes, this would usually not work. So here, yeah, around here, this point, this would be our pass band and the rest would be transition band. So this would give our audio signal uh, a very dull um, sound. So not so good. So how can we improve the pass band now? Since we already tried different compromises for the width of the transition band and the stop at attenuation, with our length L equals 16. Now we should try increasing the filter length. So we are happy with the stop at attenuation, but not with the transition width. If we try to uh, decrease the transition width, we will lose stop at attenuation. So the only other option we have is to increase the filter length going up to L equals 32. So then we have this Kaiser window Again, with beta equals 8, but now with a length L equals 32. So this is what we get. Here you can see it's having length 32. And here's the res um, resulting frequency response. So you can see, indeed, it's um, now having a much more narrow main lobe. Um, so maybe half as wide as for L equals 16. So this is actually what we want to get. Right, so now you have about the same attenuation here. So this is uh, roughly 6 dB. And we can also take a look at it here in our Jupyter Notebook. So here's now the Kaiser window for length 32. So here you can see it again from 0 to 32. So a nice round shaped window function. And when we calculate it, then we will get indeed this frequency response. So you can see here, the main lobe of our window function is much more narrow, which means we get a more narrow transition bandwidth. It's about half as wide as before. So here we see it is uh, roughly at 0.5. And before we had it here roughly at no, this was the filter. Where is my... Oh, it's in the previous lecture, unfortunately. Okay, but fortunately we can also just enter a different number here. So let's try 16. So now we have length 16, window as before, and now compare it, compare the frexy. So here we have 0.5 roughly for the width of the main lobe. And here we have slightly above one. So you can, you can see that it's doubled. So you have this rule of thumb when you double the 
uh, the window length uh, you, you have uh, the main lobe width. So it's um, also easy um, to remember and good for designing filters. But now let's go back to the other case. So here we wanted to have 32. So I have twice the length, 32 for our Kaiser window. And go back to our good frequency response. You know, isn't that nice? So it's easily comparable. We just need to change um, an entry in our website and all of a sudden it computes um, the new results. Very convenient. So now we um, also have to recalculate our ideal filter impulse response. Right. So the Kaiser window would already be our final filter if our ideal impulse response would consist of an infinite sequence of ones, meaning an infinitely narrow low pass filter. This is the case for is this is the case if our ideal filter is only a delta pulse at frequency zero, hence an infinitely small low pass filter or narrow. I actually call this narrow. Okay. So observe that the main lobe of this length 32 window up to about 0 0.17 is about half as wide as the main lobe at length 16. So this is what we just saw. In this way, we have the transition width of our resulting filter. So also this 0.17 is again this uh, 3 dB or 6 dB cutoff frequency, not the start of the passband that I just looked at. Um, just because it's easier to see where the stop uh, where the stop band begins um, than to estimate where the three or six dB um, uh, cutoff frequency is. Yeah, but it holds anyway this factor of two. But we need this number now for uh, the new calculation of our ideal impulse response. So basically, we now have to reduce the width of our ideal passband by this number. Right, which is now half as wide. So here we go from 0 0.5 down to 0 0.33. So 0 0.5 minus 0 0.17 is 0 0.33. Yeah, and that means here our omega c, the cutoff frequency now becomes 0.33 times pi in this formula here. Right. So now we also have to accommodate um, this different delay since we now have a double length uh, filter. We also need to increase this delay number accordingly. So we have now twice uh, the amount of delay from this filter because it's twice as long. Yeah, that's um, pretty much unavoidable. Except if you have um, nonlinear filters. But for linear filters, this is unavoidable. Yeah, so this impulse response, um, this ideal impulse response is now multiplied with our Kaiser window here in this Python code again. Right, so here's our ideal impulse response. This is the Kaiser window, length 32. Here, element wise multiplication and then plotting. So here you can see. The impulse response. Now you see it's uh, it's also looking quite differently because now we see also those ripples uh, from the side of this main lobe here, which we didn't see before. Right? Remember before we stopped around here and this this point here more or less, and now we have those side ripples. So it has now more similarity to a sync function. Basically, we keep more of our sync function because. Now we have a twice as long um, window function. So that means we keep twice as much from our original sync function. Yeah, so let's take a look at <coughs> the Jupyter Notebook. So again, here we have the video explaining. And here is the code. So here is now <coughs> the code for designing our filter, including the window. So here you can now see the resulting impulse response. So here, the nice ripples to the side, which makes it more of a sync function. 
Yeah, and then you can uh, compute the frequency response using Frexy. So here you go. So here you can see again we have about minus 80 dB attenuation in the stop band, starting at about half Nyquist as desired. Then here we have the transition band, but now here we have a sufficiently wide pass band, so just below one. So we can say this is the transition band and just below one we have then up to just below one we have the pass band. So this looks quite nice now. And again we have a linear phase, but this linear phase is now accordingly more steep because we have more delay. Okay. So this is what we just saw. Right. So <clears throat> Yeah, and if we take 3 dB as the limit of our pass band, let's say minus 3 dB, it goes up to normalized frequency 0 0.3. So that's pretty good. Going back to our downsampling example, where we downsample from 44.1 kHz to 22.05 kHz sampling rate, the normalized frequency of 0.5 corresponds to 11 kHz. And the upper limit of our pass band is 0.3 or 6.6 .6 kilohertz. So this now looks like a usable filter for our application. This also shows um, why the us usable frequencies in a discrete time representation is always clearly lower than the Nyquist frequency. We need filters which have transition bands, more or less wide transition bands. Okay, so now we are successful with our low pass filter design. Um, so next question is how to obtain a high pass or a band pass, uh, for instance, using so-called modulation. So the first approach is again using the ideal filter design. We again design an ideal filter and we then window it. For instance, if we want to obtain a high pass, we can start to design an ideal high pass filter using our inverse DTFT, which give, give us doubly infinite impulse response uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity, and then window this ideal impulse response to obtain an FIR filter. For the ideal high pass, we can define the desired frequency response HD as factor one at the high frequencies above our cutoff frequency omega C, and zero at the low frequencies. So here you see the formulation. This is the pass band at the high frequencies and below it is zero. And also note that this is the magnitude. So this is true for positive and negative frequencies. And the frequency range here um, usually goes from minus pi to plus pi. If you want to have a real valued impulse response, we need to make the frequency response such that its values are negative frequencies are conjugate complex of the values at positive frequencies. So the easiest way to do it here is to have the negative frequencies identical to the positive frequencies. So again, this is quite similar to our low pass example, except that we switch the roles of the ones and the zeros here as uh, factors for the magnitude uh, frequency response. So now we can apply the inverse DTFT and find an analytical solution, just like with a low pass filter to obtain the ideal impulse response and then multiply it with a window to obtain an FIR filter. All right, so far so good. Then the second approach would be to use modulation. So this means uh, we would do shifting our ideal uh, pass band uh, to the desired position in frequency. In this way we can turn a low pass into a band pass or a high pass depending on where we shift our pass band. And in this way we can turn a new problem into our known problem, the design of our low pass filter. So this is always uh, more elegant, I think. Uh, just take the known solution and uh, try to um, find uh, some sort of connection of the new problem to the old problem. And in this way, the connection 
would be the modulation. Right, we turn a new problem into our old problem. So how do we shift our passband in the frequency domain? We convolve it in the frequency domain with a Dirac impulse at the desired center frequency omega naught. So take a look here. We have some desired frequency HD of omega and we convolve it with this shifted Dirac impulse in the frequency domain. So then the result of this convolution here, as we know, when we have a shifted Dirac, then we just shift um, the function. So the real result here is a shifted frequency response, shifted by omega naught. So if you want to have real valued impulse responses, we need to preserve the symmetry between positive and negative frequencies by also shifting the frequency response by the same amount to negative frequencies. Right? Remember, positive and negative frequencies need to be conjugate um, versions of each other. And if it's real valued, then they are simply identical. So there needs to be this symmetry. Otherwise, we will get complex valued impulse responses. So that's why we would now have a convolution with two Dirac's. Here one Dirac shifted to omega naught and the other shifted to negative omega naught. Right? And as a result we have two shifted versions of our HD. One is shifted to omega naught, one is shifted to minus omega naught. So this now ensures our symmetry in the frequency domain, symmetry around frequency zero. So how does this change our ideal impulse response? To answer, we take the inverse DTFT. The convolution in the frequency domain becomes a multiplication in the time domain. Now we just need the inverse DTFT of those two Dirac pulses, right? So the inverse DTFT, uh, we just need the inverse DTFT of one in a Dirac pulse to know the answer. So to obtain it, we can simply use our formula for the inverse DTFT. So we plug it in here, Dirac of omega minus omega naught, integral from minus pi to plus pi. And we know when we uh, compute an integral over the Dirac, only the value at the position where uh, the argument becomes zero remains. So that means only the value omega equals omega naught. Right? So we just need to plug in omega naught here and what's left is 1 over 2 pi times e to the j omega naught times n. Right? So that's the solution of the Dirac in the frequency domain back in the time domain. Right. Remember, the integration of the function multiplied with the Dirac impulse is the function value at the position of the Dirac, as we just did. So here, omega naught. So this is what we um, just did. Okay. So now we can get the inverse DTFT of our two Dirac's. So for the first one, and the second one, we get those two expressions. So here we have plus omega naught, and here we have minus omega naught. And when we look at it, this is exactly the cosine of it, right? This is actually how the cosine is defined. We have one divided by pi times cosine of omega naught times n. So this is now the function which we need to multiply with our ideal low pass filter to obtain an ideal filter where the pass band is centered around omega naught instead of zero. And we call this cosine function a modulation function and the multiplication with this function a modulation. Right? So indeed we get this real valued um, sequence and element wise multiplication with this cosine function is also called a modulation. Yeah, observe that we can also introduce a phase shift p into this modulation function, for instance, turning the cosine function into a sine function. So just adding 90, 90 degrees, 
turns it into a uh, plus minus 90 degrees, turns it into a sine function plus or minus. This would still work because in the frequency domain, this is a multiplication with another complex exponential from the phase term in the time domain, just like from a time lag, right? This 90 degrees phase shift is basically like a time lag. It would, would just introduce a phase change in the final filter. So the magnitude would not change, just the phase values of the filter would change. So here's a little Python example. So this principle can also be directly applied to audio signal. So the following example takes the signal from a microphone and modulates it or multiplies it with a 500 hertz sine function and then plays it back. So this is not really working in the Jupyter notebook. So I'm opening now a um, a um, terminal window. Let's see. Open a terminal window. Open a terminal. Here you go. Make the font larger and then open an editor to show you what's inside. So again, this is also in Moodle 2, so you should download it and try it yourself to see if it works also on your computer and maybe change the modulation frequency to see or hear the effect. So here it sets up um, or imports uh, um, libraries for accessing the sound card, Pi Audio. Here it defines the block size of 5000 sample. So this is a rather large block size and I intentionally made this large to introduce some delay uh, to uh, make the original sound and the reproduced sound more easily distinguishable. The um, reproduced sound is then like an echo, right? It appears like half a second or so later, or quarter, quarter second later. Right here we have 32,000 sampling, um, 32,000 samples per second. So 5,000 would be about a sixth of a second, right? Yeah, and then I limit the recording to eight seconds here. Here I open the sound card. And here I have the for loop over the eight seconds. Here I'm reading um, the 5,000 samples from the sound card as 16-bit um, integers. Here I unpack, meaning I convert 16-bit integer into 32-bit um, integers, short integers. Right here I turn it into a list, which is maybe not really necessary. Here I now um, define my um, modulation function. So here you can now see S is my modulation function now consisting of the sine function in NumPy. So here, 2 pi divided by sampling rate times 500, right? So 500 is now our um, modulation frequency. So you can think about this as the sampling frequency, 2 pi, and then you have 500 divided by sampling rate. This would be the, re the normalized um, frequency for 500 hertz normalized to the sampling frequency. Yeah, and here you have um, the size of our block from the sound card, the 5000 samples. So this S is a sine um, function at frequency 500 hertz at 32 kilohertz sampling rate consisting of 5000 samples. And then here in the next step, we multiply it element-wise. So here we take the samples from our sound card, multiply it with our modulation function, S, and cast it as type int. Then here next, we clip. So we need to have this cast because this S is a float, right? So the product is also a float number, and I turn it back into an integer. So these are sequences of integers then, or an array of integers again. 
Here I clip it to make sure to not overload the sound card because if I overload the sound card then it gives me an error message and it stops and I don't want that. So here I limit it to minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. Remember that 16-bit gives me a value range of minus 2 to the uh, 15th to plus 2 to the 15th which is slightly more than 32,000. Yeah, so this is um, the normal integer format for, for Python, um, more than 16-bit, and here I pack it back into 16-bit integer values, data consisting then of a stream of 16-bit integers, and that is something I can write back to the audio card uh, for playback. And in the end, it stops. So let's see what it does. So now I can execute it. Let's see if it works with Python 3. This is the test. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, test. 1, 1, 2, 2. 1, 2. Yeah, so you could hear my original voice, but then as an echo, you could also hear this kind of Mickey Mouse voice, right? This soft Mickey Mouse voice in the background. I could also change this to 1000 maybe. Let's see how it sounds when I'm using 1000. Maybe increase the volume here a little bit. And do it again. This is the test. One, two, three. One, two, three. Test Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. So you could hear it's even more extreme. Or when I try 200 Hertz. Should be less extreme. This is our test, test for 250. Yeah, so you could, could hear that it's again sounding like a Mickey Mouse, but not quite as extreme. Right, so the sounds and the voice sound higher pitched, like a Mickey Mouse voice, as a result of the frequency shift. But observe this modulation now consists of shifting up and down, right? We, we have this um, Dirac pulse at the positive and negative frequencies, which means it's not only adding this frequency, but it's also subtracting this frequency. It's just that this um, the added version is more prominent or more distinguishable from the result. The low shifted version is so low that it's not so obvious. Yeah, so in conclusion, we can shift our ideal filter in the frequency domain by multiplying the ideal or already windowed impulse response with a modulation function uh, like this cosine here. So here we have P is the phase, um, some phase delay, which could turn this cosine into a sine, for instance. Yeah, and this is illustrated in this following. In the following pictures, first we have a low pass original spectrum. So here, this would be um, the frequency response of the frequency response. Right. So some low pass filter, some idealized or some some fantasy low pass filter. And then we multiply it with our modulation function with frequency omega naught. And imagine omega naught is here, then this filter will all of a sudden appear at uh, around omega naught, right? So here at those two sides. What's also interesting to see is when you look at a low pass filter, basically what you're concerned is is only the positive half from zero to omega c usually you, ne you neglect the negative frequencies from zero to minus omega c but when you modulate it then these negative frequencies now also appear as below omega naught so here you will see that the band pass the re resulting band pass will have band pass will have twice the bandwidth as the low pass originally had because for the low pass you only consider the positive half for the band pass all of a sudden both parts are relevant and hence you will get um, twice the bandwidth 
right? So this is also an example where negative frequencies all of a sudden become relevant. Yeah, so up to obtain a high pass, we need to shift the pass band from zero to pi, and hence we get omega naught equals pi. So basically, we in, instead of centering around frequency zero, we now center it around frequency pi, which is Nyquist. Yeah, and we can simply do that. If we choose p equals zero, then the modulation function simply becomes cosine of pi of n. And when you look at it, this is simply a sequence of plus minus um, one over pi, I should say here. Right. So basically, we just switch every second sample if we neglect this factor pi. So for instance, for a low pass filter here, we get here our ideal impulse response, here our Kaiser window, and here we have our resulting um, low pass filter. And we can simply make a high pass out of it using this multiplication. So I'm neglecting this factor of one over pi. So I just simply multiply it with cosine of pi times um, n, right? And this, remember, gives me plus a sequence of plus minus one. And then we can plot the impulse response, and this is what we will get. So this is looking much less nice, and this is because we flip every second sign here. So we have a lot of wiggle going up and down, basically from one sample down, negative, next sample is positive, and so on. So that's the effect. Let's see if we also have it here in our Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, so here you have my modulation function. Here the diagrams that we just saw. And here you can see our low pass filter. And here you can see the modulation and then the plotting. So here you can see it a little nicer. Every second sample has a sign change basically here. And this is the resulting impulse response that we get. So we see that not every sample has a, is now on a different sign. That's because before they were on opposite signs and now they are on the same sign. Yeah, and as a resulting frequency response, this is what we get. And indeed, this looks very familiar to our low pass, except that it's mirrored, right? So what was frequency zero, now is frequency pi, right? So now we have the same shape, but we pass the high frequencies and then we stop the low frequencies. So this confirms it works quite nicely, right, this modulation. So here, perfect switch or perfect mirroring of our frequency response. Yeah, so you obtain a high pass, basically looks mirrored around the center. It really is shifted, but what we see as the high pass part was negative frequency part of our low pass. So what was below zero. So we can now also obtain a band pass with a, a center frequency of pi over two by modulating with the cosine of pi over two instead of pi. Right now we have a pi over two here. Then the rest of the formula stays the same and this is what we get. So let me also do it in the Jupyter notebook. So here's the modulation with pi over two and this is what we get. And you can see, indeed, the bandwidth now is twice as much, right? Before we had a, um, a bandwidth band pass of uh, about pi over two, and um, now it's twice as much. So when you compare it here, you have like half Nyquist would be here. Here we have the transition band, and we saw that um, the pass band is about 0.3 Nyquist. 
So when we look at the band pass, now the uh, pass band is 0.6 Nyquist, which we see here. And then we have the transition band twice, twice. So one time at the upper end and one time at the lower end. And that's why this appears now much wider. Right. So indeed we get a band pass. So if you want to have um, a band pass which is more narrow, then we need to define a low pass which is more narrow. So if you want to have a band pass which has the same bandwidth as the low pass originally had, you need to define uh, or design a low pass which has only half the width of the pass band. So yeah, observe that we obtain a pass band in this um, band pass case which is twice as wide as in the case of a low pass or high pass because here the negative frequencies of the low or high pass case appear as the other half of the pass band as could be seen in this figure one. Okay, yeah, that should be it for today's lecture. So thanks for your attention and see you next time.